Hi, my name is Ted Osborne. I am a senior director at PSNS. I have been with the firm for a few years and I run the science and technology group and I am deeply involved in the UAM movement and our UAM task force. Chuck? Hello everyone, I'm Chuck Clauser, uh, also from PSNS, Senior Director of Architecture, uh, with an aviation background as a commercial pilot and flight instructor. Uh, I lead the uh, uh, Urban Air Task Force for uh, PSNS and um, a member of the board member actually of the American Helicopter uh, Museum and Educational Center in Pennsylvania. Uh, member of the Vertical Flight Society, served on a workshop with uh, Vertical Flight Society on infrastructure, and served on two of Veron Vehicles uh, think tank sessions uh, recently over the past uh, month and a half, and very happy to participate in uh, this greeting to you. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Ganley. I'm trained as an architect here with PSNS for a couple of years or so. Uh, most focused on the science and technology industry uh, with early starts with Uber in the UAM world, uh, working and developing the Skyport Summit and um, continuing with, with the charge with the team here uh, and the, our own internal task force. Leonardo da Vinci said, once you've tested flight, you will walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been and there you will long to return. PSNS has tested flight, tasted flight, and we are working on our return. But who is PSNS? PSNS is a full service integrated architecture and engineering firm established over 58 years ago with nearly 300 professionals on staff, providing architecture and engineering, land development, energy and environmental engineers, and serving a diverse private and public sectors. We offer a full range of professional services from architecture, site civil engineering, structural engineering, mechanical, electrical, plumbing and fire protection, environmental engineering, and energy services. Energy services includes a wind farm that we actually did down in Atlantic City. Our market sectors range from education, utility and energy, healthcare, hospitality, the public sector, our real estate markets, and most importantly, our science and technology in which our UAM task force lives. Our core team who will be speaking with you today are made up of principals of the firm. About two years ago, PSNS established a UAM task force and knew it was important to have principal involvement. The group is piloted, quote, pun intended, by Chuck Clauser who's a senior director and architect with more than 40 years of experience. He is also a licensed pilot and a flight instructor and started his career, career serving in the US Navy on an aircraft carrier. Jennifer Ganley is also trained as an architect with more than 20 years experience and focuses on our science and technology clients. But more importantly, she has been serving the UAM movement from the very beginning with Uber as our client and myself, who is a senior director of the firm with more than 40 years experience as an architect and urban planner. And I have spent my career in urban planning and I run our science and technology group. We live on a planet that is rapidly urbanizing. Right now, more than half of the world's population live in cities and another 2.5 billion people are projected to move into urban areas by 2050. Prior to the effects of COVID isolation and our virtual internet connectivity culture, major shifts in demographic travel behavior and technologies have changed how people travel. 
People are choosing the best mobility options based on trip time, cost, comfort, and convenience. And post COVID, we believe this urbanization movement will return. To support this growing urbanization of our planet, we need an alternative transportation option that reduces congestion, reduces traffic, population, pollution, noise, and infrastructure costs, and works to improve our quality of life. We believe that the UAM movement is a part of that solution, an innovative solution to neg neg negatively affect the effects of urbanization. And as urban planners, we feel we have a tremendous opportunity to rewrite how transportation systems work and to reshape our urban and suburban areas into cleaner, safer, less congested, congested and smarter. Ultimately, our goal is to move to make transportation accessible, reliable, and convenient for everyone everywhere. But where do we begin? We began with a concept, a concept that pairs EV tolls with an intermodal hub that connects traditional ground transportation with air mobility. What does this design look like and where do we start? Well, we begin with concept sketches with the notion of bringing people together using all traditional modes of transportation. We begin exploring organic designs that accentuate movement, a movement to where they can ultimately take to the sky. Our introduction to this new frontier was a challenge presented to us, along with many other design firms at the second annual Uber Elevate Summit. The challenges was developed a transportation hub that would support a new mode of transportation, the EV tall, and link urban air mobility with the urban city fabric. We developed a transportation hub that supports all modes of electrical vehicles, from scooters and bicycles to electric cars. These were all then connected with a Skyport for the new Uber, new Uber EV tall. Uber selected Ted and my entry, as well as two other winners of the Skyport Architecture Reimagined Competition. However, we didn't stop there. We have continued to introduce urban air mobility and the Skyport concept to our clients and our local cities and communities to connect people in places that currently do not have access to many modes of mass transportation. Again, continuing with our goal to make transportation accessible, reliable, and convenient for everyone, everywhere. So what's next? We create industry partnerships to help investigate the regulation, design solutions, the development of code compliance skyports with the same underlying goal of being operational by 2023. We continue to expand our partnerships to help the growth and acceptance of this new mode of transportation. Our skyports are designed to be a practical solution to make our communities more accessible and help shape the future of our cities. As we continue to develop these partnerships, we have looked at the integration of the skyport concept into many different landscapes across the world and are now investigating our opportunities in Latin America, Europe, and elsewhere. So who are our partners? Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Ted. Um, uh, as both Ted and Jennifer have uh, illustrated here in moments before, um, we have been involved for the past 18 months, 24 months, uh, very deeply involved, uh, consuming everything that we can, frankly, get our hands on. Because as planners and architects and engineers, we want to know everything. And the more that we can 
more information we can garner to ourselves, I think the more effective uh, we can be in vertiport design and uh, EVTOL planning, certainly urban air and advanced air planning. So Jennifer has uh, also illustrated uh, concepts uh, for Uber. We're also proud to uh, have an association with uh, Jaunt Air Mobility, who recently launched their Access Skyways a partnership, along with uh, Jaunt, of course, us and Price Systems. And last but certainly not least, uh, our host of our own uh, think tank uh, series. We uh, function as panelists on two of those and are very, very happy to be involved. And um, looking at air mobility in uh, Latin America is indeed um, uh, a, a great opportunity to uh, hone our skills and our working and knowledge. Uh, we also have built uh, involvement with a number of other sources within the uh, community. I'm a member of the NASA uh, Transformative Vertical Flight Working Group number three when we're looking at the vertiport design. And that white paper that we're all uh, collaborating on is due to be launched in uh, November, actually. We're all members of the Vertical Flight Society, which uh, you all know is the hub and uh, center for information for everything to do with uh, rotary wing and, uh, and vertical flight. If you're members, that's wonderful. You already know and take advantage of it. If you're not, I suggest you look into that. Uh, we sat on as a panelist on uh, an infrastructure workshop that was put on earlier this year by uh, Vertical Flight Society. And I hope you've caught uh, others of their workshops as well. Uh, we've also formed a strategic partnership with uh, Rex Alexander, who many of you know uh, as an infrastructure specialist from Five Alpha. And I sit on the board of the American Helicopter and Educational Center in uh, Westchester, PA. On the next slide, we're going to talk about um, the various items that we're all facing today in, in the EVTOL community and air mobility and advanced uh, air mobility. And sorry for the list, but the truth is, these are the items that all of us are facing. And we in particular, as Skyport designers, uh, again, we wanna know everything so that we can be effective. So airspace is currently awaiting regulations and that, that airspace uh, is being looked at very carefully by NASA being developed by NASA and has been, certainly with uh, strong input from the FAA and those regulations are designed to fit in between where uh, drones are currently operating and the national airspace system is currently operating without any market changes to uh, the NAS. So we want to watch that very carefully because that will affect uh, vertiport design for sure. All of the aircraft and many are nearing uh, final phases of testing, or I should say some are uh, according to vertical flight there are well over 300 manufacturers worldwide that are looking at the creation of eVTOL aircraft in one form or another. Uh, location for uh, any vertiport first is really going to be demand-based. What, um, what is the demand that exists in any particular region uh, that must first be studied to create a hub uh, network maybe placed with a, an existing transportation center uh, and that ties into local zoning. So both the city zoning uh, will have to step up and create uh, the zoning ordinances that are going to be needed to allow vertical flight to take place in, in any particular area of a city, of a state. State departments of transportation will certainly uh, be involved and have a say in the matter. And many states have their own bureaus or departments of transportation which will um, also create the regulations that will govern. Uh, as planners, designers, architects, we live with uh, code compliance every day in all of our projects. And the few that we show here simply imply that there are uh, building code regulations, uh, fire codes of, of every variety, and certainly the FAA regulations, standards, advisory circulars that exist right now that we believe are going to uh, morph into those that are needed to support this EVTOL uh, air mobility. 
environmental, we, we are looking at that as well because the right now we're looking at battery technology for the aircraft and this is high energy, um, uh, you know, battery sources. So how they are delivered and uh, removed from the site, exchanged out, perhaps reclaimed, is something that we need to be looking at as well and make sure that that is managed. Um, and together with that, uh, we'll all need to be talking very, very early with our public utilities who will be providing the required high energy uh, electrical service that's going to be necessary to uh, power up the switch gear and the batteries to the aircraft systems. And the skyports themselves as a category, well, there's going to be various building types that can range from a rooftop, whether it's a high rise, mid rise or low rise, uh, independent uh, new greenfield uh, buildings, uh, perhaps even waterfront uh, facilities. And they can be passenger carrying, they could be cargo, they could be any number of a variety of functions that, um, that would serve the industry. So additionally, with Vertiport design, including the location, the, the access that uh, the passenger community, as well as our staff and even first responders should have come to that, needs to be very, very carefully analyzed as, so that the flow through the facility makes sense, is efficient and works and works well without obstruction. And the phrase curb to deck, uh, we borrowed that from our friend, Daryl Swanson, who uh, has talked about that on numerous occasions as well. So in addition, uh, we'll also be looking at the integration of various types of equipment. A couple that we mentioned here, communication, navigation, uh, surveillance equipment carried by the aircraft, certainly by the fleet operators and most assuredly uh, within the uh, FBO at each of these um, vertiports will have to be integrated. And we're, we're projecting that uh, weather information uh, will be on a vastly different scale than it is right now. Um, and we think, and there's certainly a lot of conversation being developed right now on integrating weather data into aircraft systems and in the, net, na the navigation operational systems of aircraft so that it becomes real-time uh, information to operate in this new airspace system. A lot of integration there is expected. Uh, naturally, we'll be looking at the accommodation of staff for both the uh, FBO, the flight deck folks, uh, the, the flight crew as well, and uh, assure that their accommodations are correct and uh, efficient. The operations most likely, you know, for passenger carrying anyway, uh, will mirror what exists now with our Part 135 scheduled airline, you know, uh, structure. Uh, but that final word comes from the uh, FAA, and indeed it will depend on the type of operation uh, that is under consideration. All of this needs to be both safe, secure, reliable, not only in the building, but the enterprise itself, the entire enterprise, the entire function. Uh, from beginning to end and all aspects. Uh, the public is going to demand it. It's going to come from data. It's going to come from government. It's going to come from the manufacturers themselves, from the operators, and we who are providing the facilities uh, for use. Uh, noise mitigation is uh, an ongoing topic. Uh, we really won't have the definitive words on that, and that's plural because I think uh, each type of aircraft that is being developed now will have different um, sound profiles, and those profiles are going to be very, very carefully studied to see how they can be best managed, accommodated, and mitigated if necessary. We've already spoken about weather, but here we're talking about not equipment so much, but the actual real-time weather certainly is going to affect operations uh, on a daily basis. So the more we know about aircraft weather data real time, I think the better the operations will, uh, will be fine tuned. And lastly, uh, we must consider the unplanned and look for uh, certainly emergency situations, critical uh, items that uh, may appear, uh, alerts, uh, passenger uh, needs and requirements, uh, those kinds of things where delays uh, might be a part of, a, of, of an upset in a day. So we want to know that, we want to plan for it, we want to understand it, we want to be able to make sure that 
our efforts into designing a system uh, truly works. So looking ahead, what is, what is the future of air mobility overall? Certainly the aircraft and systems have to be developed. They're gonna be developed by data. The data is gonna be fed to the federal uh, agencies for their regulations and for the real-time development of systems that work within the, uh, the new regulations, the new airspace, the new operational uh, characteristics that are going to form part and parcel of this entire enterprise. We'll be watching for the operational regulations. We'll be looking for the certifications. All of that feeds back to the facility uh, design, facility accommodations, and how we get ready to accommodate and accept and use uh, all of this uh, information that's going to come from uh, government and from the manufacturers and uh, the operational side of things. The vertiport design standards, it's, uh, I think the building regulations are going to have to catch up. The NFPA and the fire regulations will have to also catch up uh, for accommodation. Uh, the FAA is certainly going to have something to say about uh, not only the flight deck standards there, but also the facility as a terminal. They have existing regulations for that right now and standards, I should say. And we'll be looking for uh, what comes out of uh, federal government from there as well. Airspace regulations, I'm thinking here that that's going to be uh, focused upon how they serve and affect um, placement of the vertiport, uh, how we uh, apply for the in and out courses for the final approach into the FATOs uh, for each of these uh, regular for each of these uh, vertiport locations, and we'll watch very carefully to see how the air traffic control situation evolves. Uh, will will corridors be adopted? Will scheduled routing um, be part of the system? There are num uh, numerous things that I think our federal government, certainly NASA, is looking at right now. Uh, we know that. Varon Vehicles has uh, studied this for um, their applications throughout South America. And uh, I think that they have a leg up on what they would like to do. I think it's based on good common sense and knowledge of the system. So we want to keep an eye on that as well. Public acceptance, absolutely uh, a top requirement. None of this is going to happen without the full acceptance by the public. And that that acceptance is going to come only from the uh, the reliability that is uh, out there. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Local zoning ordinances have to be created. They have to be stood up. Uh, and uh, we as developers and those that are creating these facilities will comply with the zoning ordinances. But prior to that, we can also help inform uh, local government with that. And don't forget, uh, CAMI, the Community uh, Air Mobility Initiative, are folks that are very much uh, deep into this. I think you should check uh, them out as well and the work that they're doing. Uh, I think they're making tremendous strides in um, advising uh, our local and state communities into um, how to plan for air mobility. Safety, security throughout the system, throughout the enterprise, throughout the entire uh, to and fro of, of all operational characteristics and in the building itself. Again, Daryl starting from the curb all the way through to the flight deck. And, uh, and the goal of course is to enjoy the uh, same reliability that uh, our airline standards uh, have right now. Later on, uh, industry will arise to support uh, these new facilities. That's the uh, MRO, the maintenance uh, repair and overhaul uh, network the suppliers, manufacturers, the subsystems, assembly, uh, the logistics, uh, blockchain, all of that uh, will arise and have their own facilities uh, required as well. So we see a tremendous growth uh, throughout the industry for a whole host of, um, of enterprises. And as Ted said in the very beginning, the idea of air mobility is to provide access for all. And, and is that not what we all want? And I think that that's a global requirement. I think it's a global desire. And it's something that none of us should lose sight of. I don't think we are. There's more and more uh, conversation about this uh, entire enterprise as we call it 
uh, being supportive of all of humanity. It's, we're going to start small. There's no question about it, but uh, that, that's what we'll be delivering towards. And lastly, uh, this will become a multi-mission um, mobility system that will affect so many parts of society, not only in passenger moving, movement, not only in uh, cargo movement, but also all of those humanistic um, side of uh, our society's needs like medical, like governmental support, like observation and news and uh, critical responses and on the spot uh, coverages and, and those kinds of things that um, bring mobility into the 21st century, into the third dimension. And um, that is something that we are all helping to plan for and look for and support uh, the entire network that's going on. So indeed, this is sooner than you think. We're all working towards this. This is a uh, vibrant community that we find ourselves in. We're proud to be part of it. We wanna learn more. We wanna contribute more. We're gonna be absorbing everything that we possibly can as time goes forward, moves forward. And I wanna thank, and we wanna thank uh, Varon Vehicles for putting together this um, opportunity uh, to uh, present ourselves to you and uh, share with the community the work that we've been doing. So thank you very much.